Welcome to you all, you happy warriors, you eager devotees of the Rabbi Daniel Appen Show. Hey, why do I call you happy warriors? Well, if you're new to the show, then you probably don't realize that I see every one of you listeners, regardless of your age or your shape or your condition, I see you either as a beautiful and nubile woman or as a handsome and virile man. Those, that, that, that's the full spectrum of my audience on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. This is because we, show, we focus here... Um, not just on your body, but on your soul. And I suspect that almost every one of you listening has a young, passionate, vibrant soul. What is more, we are all happy warriors because to live productively, you have to fight every day against the force of entropy, if nothing else. You fight to upkeep and maintain your possessions. You fight to build and maintain your family and your business, your profession or career. Life is a fight, and that's a good thing. To stop fighting and seeking and striving, well, that's called dying. And I call you not just warriors, but happy warriors. Because to throw yourself into the fight... For eight or ten hours a day, six days a week is is one thing. But to do that all with a debonair smile on your face and a jaunty pace to your stride, to do all that while generating an irrepressible surge of happiness welling up in your soul, well, that means you must be spiritually grounded in everything that is life-affirming. You are devoted to your faith, your families, your finances, your friends— knowing that, yes, you can triumph over those who both intentionally and unknowingly promote a dark abyss of satanic secular socialism and all the many social pathologies it generates. When I reveal how the world really works, it's in the hope that you will help defeat those pathetic creatures of modern secular fundamentalism, those orphans in history who possess neither Judeo-Christian fortitude nor even pagan ferocity, which would almost be welcome, (laughs) those hideous hermaphrodites and fanatical feminists running our media, education, and government bureaucracies, who possess neither the strength of men nor the intuitive wisdom of women, but what damage they manage to inflict. Well, here on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, I solemnly commit to help you transform any timidity you might have to triumph. Together, we will replace diffidence with determination and displace the divided counsels of doubt with the steady eyes and firm hearts of those who, just like us, know where they are going and know just how they are going to get there. We strive for success first with our families and our faith, then our finances and our friendships, forming bonds of the like-minded, after which we will be ready to take on the formidable task of saving our frighteningly fragile civilization from those who would force us to surrender our freedoms and our souls to the whims and dictates of those who consider themselves to be our superiors, our elites, our betters, our bosses, our rulers. But before we change the world, we have to change ourselves. And what a good start we have. Each of you happy warriors, a gentle giant with a huge and humble heart. Yes, we will succeed. But before we make the world a better place, we have to make our own homes and our own businesses better places. And then our efforts and our dreams can become leveraged, and together we achieve so much more. The two sure ways of building a bridge over the dark abyss of mortality we all face is by building a family, building our finances, and connecting with others who share our worldview, or even others who share part of our worldview. Connecting is crucial. Connecting is key to 
communicating, to collaborating, and to creating. And today, we are going to take a look at one of the ways that the other team seeks to undermine our entire civilization. One is by weakening it economically and financially. Yes, that's right. That is something that they do. Now, how on earth do you get people to agree to actions that are self-destructive? How do you get people to go along with this idea of damaging our economy, hurting our ability to function, and everybody goes along with it? Well, there's only one way to do that, and that is by borrowing the powers and fuel that propels the good team forward, and that is a sense of moral virtue, a sense on being on the side of progressive history in a good sense, not the way the left uses the term progressive. How is that done? By converting the mere policies, in many cases converting evil strategies that secular fundamentalism uses. Secular fundamentalism, as you know, is the official religion of the government, of the bureaucrats, of academia, of of entertainment in the United States, all the main opinion makers and idea generators in American society, and this is true for other countries in the world as well, uh, actually do have a religion. And uh, their religion uh, possesses many of the same features as my religion does, and maybe your religion. Uh, their religion of secular fundamentalism does answer the fundamental question of how did human beings arrive on this planet, to which there are only two answers, and one answer from biblical faith and the other answer from the religion of secular fundamentalism. And uh, it even explains what we ought to be doing on this planet, where the biblical religions of Judaism and Christianity— Um, say that what we should be doing on this planet is building God's kingdom, essentially uh, doing the things that the Bible describes as positive behavior that benefits other people and the culture and preserves the longevity of our civilization. Those are the things we should be doing. What does the other team, how does the other team answer this question of what should should we be doing? Well, it's, 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 it's very simple. Uh, their answer is that uh, we should be fighting the obvious godless hopelessness of the secular future. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is we have to save the planet, because clearly in a godless secular environment, the planet is doomed. And how do we do that? Well, this religion secular fundamentalism, like genuine religion, has sacred sacraments. And the most sacred sacrament of secular fundamentalism is recycling, because it validates the religious doctrine of shortage and scarcity. And so just imagine what would happen if uh, your city council sent a Bible to every house saying, we'd like you to read this once a week, once a day. There'd be outrage, right? This is the state promoting a religion, and there'd be an absolute outrage. But when the state promotes the religion of secular fundamentalism, nobody objects. That's how brilliantly this is all being done. What do I mean by that? Well, the state sends you containers or forces you to purchase containers uh, marked glass, plastic, cans, paper, etc., etc. In other words, uh, they send you all the, the little religious artifacts of the sacred sacrament of recycling. That's how they do it. 
and there's nothing you can do. You put them in your kitchen, and you uh, genuflect to them every day. You go to them, and you bow down to them, and you put different things in different ones to feed these idols of secular fundamentalism. And then you put them on the curb, and you put this one on the curb, and that one on the curb, and the other one on the curb. And uh, the temple, the huge temple of secular fundamentalism, sends around high priests who come along and separate and they take this package in one place and they take this package to the other place and then you fondly believe that when you go to your local coffee shop uh, you pick up a napkin and you read oh it's made from recycled products and then you buy a bottle of water somewhere where i bought a bottle of water in las vegas i think I, I told you about this i bought a bottle of water in las vegas and the bottle on the bottle of water there's a long description of how the bottle is made of 30 percent recycled plastic and the lid is small it, it uses less plastic than most bottles, and, um, and even the plastic it does use is made from recycled. Look, I don't know how they get away with those lies. I really don't know how they get away with those, those lies. I don't have the faintest idea how it's done. Uh, you would have thought that there must be, I mean, you know, because we all rely on government doing everything, or you'd think there'd be some aggressive journalist, but I know that no journal in the country, no paper would uh, print anything that a journalist wrote along the lines I'm about to suggest, and no no journalist would jeopardize his career by exploring the truth, which is that when products say made with recycle, it's simply not true. It's simply not true. The reason you can know it, even without any honest journalist writing it, is because there is no economical way of recycling anything at the moment. Possibly in some places aluminum cans, but not everywhere. But forget about paper or plastic or bottles. No, it, it, it's not economical. So this, uh, this, this company, whatever it is, that claims to be using recycled paper for its napkins or claims to be using recycled plastic they'd either have to be charging significantly more for their product, which just makes no business sense at all, or they would have to be lying. And I think it's most likely that they are simply lying because it doesn't make sense. What are you saying, Rabbi Daniel Lappin? How can this be? Recycling makes a lot of sense. It's going to save the planet. You are talking out of your hat. It's impossible. Everybody knows that recycling is a wonderful program that everybody should do. Well, um, actually, not true. And even the New York Times which publishes all the doctrine of secular fundamentalism, even the New York Times was forced uh, a few months ago to publish some facts about recycling. Yes, it doesn't exist, my friends. I'll tell you the details as soon as we come back. But uh, if this is a warning, if your delicate and gentle ears are not ready for the truth, which is that after you have laboriously separated out, your pizza box goes in one place and your sandwich wrapper goes there and your bottles go in this other container and your cans go here and, and your plastic goods go there and you're using a precious floor space in your little house used up with these different containers. Um, if, if it would hurt you to know, that all of that, after all your arduous work, all of that gets put together and dumped in the same garbage dump, in the same landfill, um, if you're not ready to hear that, well, this would be a good time to turn off. And I would be sad to lose you. I'd be sad. I would know there's one less person listening. But at the same time, this is a, uh, a rough language warning for those with delicate ears. If you're not ready to hear the truth about what really happens to the stuff that you so carefully recycle, then by all means, you should turn off now. But before you turn off, you definitely want to make a note of our website, rabbidaniellappin.com. 
And uh, uh, right over there, you want to take a look at a resource called Perils of Profanity. Look, uh, I guarantee you, if you use obscene language, if you use vulgar language, if you cannot talk uh, or tell a joke or, or do anything at all without dropping in uh, verbal bombs, then this is costing you. It's costing you financially. It's costing you socially and romantically. It is damaging now, I'm not talking about your soul now. I'm talking about your real-world concerns. And if you know anybody, if you have relatives or anybody, friends you care about, then this small, inexpensive audio program is life-changing. It really does help people get rid of the verbal tick of bad language. And uh, the reason is because it explains very logically, number one, how it hurts you, and number two, precisely how to overcome it. All of that on uh, the Rabbi Daniel Appen Show. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back together, dear listeners, on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Thanks so much for being part of the show, and uh, thank you always for the role that you play in promoting the show. Uh, I... I, it's obviously, it's not everybody, I guess, but s large enough numbers of you are telling other people about the show or sending links or whatever it is. But it's only, it's only by word of mouth that the audience for a show like this actually grows. And uh, you must be doing something right on that level, which I deeply appreciate. Uh, it's, it's really one of the two uh, best things you can do for me. Uh, the, the two things are, number one, help promote the show, which uh, makes it easier for me to make it as uh, good a show as I possibly can. And the other thing is to make sure that whenever you need life-enhancing resources in the areas of faith, family, friendships, and, yes, finance, that you visit our store at rabbidaniellappin.com. So those are the two main things. But, um, okay, so uh, here's, here's what we're talking about. I am going to be talking about the financial aspects of recycling. And the, the reason for that is that it impacts almost everything. The book I'm currently working on, which, God willing, I will be finished soon, um, is precisely the relationship between money and sex or perhaps money and marriage in, in polite circles, but taken, it, taken down to its core, taken down to its bare fundamental principles. Uh, a lot of people think that romantic relationships should, oh, you don't want let money intrude into that. This should be a pure love, uncontaminated by financial concerns. Oh, she loves me. She's not a money grabber. She's not a gold digger. No, she loves me for who I am. Well, you foolish man, don't you understand that money is an integral part of who you are? Money tells us a whole lot about how you've spent your life, not necessarily chasing after money, no, serving other people building relationships. It might tell us something about your relationship with your parents and your grandparents. It might tell us about uh, how diligent you are, how self-disciplined you are. Uh, any woman would be crazy to get involved with you and not know anything at all about your finances. That would make no sense at all. And uh, a woman like that would be a fool. Uh, and, and likewise... And likewise, if, uh, if a man is interested in a particular woman who herself is absolutely focused on her career and is measuring herself in terms of financial income, uh, he would be a fool. You see, because men and women are not the same. You see, there is a reason that in Genesis 127, it says male and female, he created them because they're different. And because a man has more genetic DNA similarity with a whale than he does with a woman. 
we are different from one another. And how we relate to money is very different uh, from one another and should be. It's absolutely correct. Anyways, I, I tell you all of that because uh, a lot of people think that there are topics that are immune to money. Uh, and I can't, Im- <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine one, but you know, let's you know, let's imagine your great love. And I know this is the, the sort of uh, mock topic I always seize upon. But let's say your obsession is middle period Etruscan pottery. Um, even so, you know, you might think there you are living in the ivory towers of academia, lecturing bright-eyed students on the intricacies of middle period Etruscan pottery. And you have nothing to do with the crassness of commerce. You are a dedicated academic intellectual. Uh, Well, guess what? Uh, The only way you keep your job and get paid for it is if your department stays in business and if the university stays in business. You see where I'm going. There is really no way to insulate yourself from money. It's a real part of life. That's just the way God created the world. And it's a, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Anyways, um, I, I tell you that uh, because I am going to be analyzing the, uh, the money aspect of recycling, which is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, if, if something is money losing for a period of time, then either we can track down who is subsidizing it, or it's not long for this world. But um, when money is brought into existence, it's evidence that one person has served another person, or one group of people has served another group of people. Uh, You know, there was a, uh, it's it's 2004, there was a movie called The Aviator. It's a very interesting movie about uh, Howard Hughes. Um, who was an enigmatic, very strange personality, but um, and even just just to watch his decline uh, through it's all it, I f- I find that sort of thing interesting. But there was an unforgettable line there where uh, Howard Hughes is talking to the mother of his girlfriend. She's supposed to be Mrs. Hepburn, and uh, he says she says he 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 says something along the lines of what I'm talking about, the financial aspect of things, and her response is to sort of draw herself up and look down her nose at him and she says we don't care about money here and quick as a snap Howard Hughes responds that's because you have it so this um, elitist uh, pretense that uh, money isn't important is something indulged in only by uh, the very wealthy now Uh, Let's just clarify some sort of basic economics here. Certain unarguable, simple, straightforward facts. The average family in America, you know, mother, father, two kids, rough average family, uh, produces about 40 pounds of trash, total garbage a week. All right, that includes your empty bottles, your cans, your unfinished pizza, um, everything, about 40 pounds a week. Uh, multiply that by 52 pounds, uh, 52 weeks in the year, and you get approximately round numbers. You get about a ton of trash. So uh, each f- average family produces about a ton of trash a year. Now, uh, to dump that trash in a landfill uh, costs about roughly uh, 60, 60 to 70 dollars. Let's just call it 60 dollars for the moment. Okay, uh, it costs 60 dollars a year. All right. So, um, you know, you you follow what I'm saying. It it, it costs money to uh, run a truck, to pick it up, for men to to work, uh, the the landfill owners. uh, And it doesn't make any difference if they're owned by a city or if they're owned by a private corporation that contracts to the city. makes absolutely no difference. In the final analysis, it costs a certain amount of money to, to dig a landfill, to line it safely, to dispose of methane generated. And landfills, in my view today, are absolutely 100% safe. They are leak-proof. Um, they, uh, they, they're just fine. And, um, and, and we've been operating landfills both here and around the world for long enough so that it's just not an issue at all, in my view. You want to disagree? Do your own research. But um, uh, my point is that 
It therefore costs roughly $60 to get rid of all the garbage you produce in a year. Divide that by 12 months, and that's 5 bucks a month. So it really should be a $5 a month expense to get rid of all your garbage. I think you know how much money your city takes from you for getting rid of your garbage. And um, it's nowhere near $5 a month. The average family pays considerably more. Uh, I'm not going to give a number because it varies enormously from municipality to municipality, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. My point is that um, uh, there are you know, there are two reasons. Number one, cities use trash collection as a huge money generator. All right, cities around the country, in some states much worse than in other states. California, obviously problematic. New Jersey, New York, very problematic. Uh, Maryland, very problematic. Uh, cities around the the country are carrying huge unfunded uh, benefits and pension liabilities. That's because uh, cities, in in most cases, much rather spend money on employees and benefits uh, rather than spending them on repairing roads or making sure that their traffic lights are synchronized. Uh, again, that is the way of the struggle and the war in America today between the rulers and the ruled. Uh, Take your money and distribute it among their friends as patronage. By the way, this is no different from a 17th century Polish count uh, who would take the work of his peasants and distribute it among his favored friends. I mean, nothing nothing has changed. Uh, As long as you look at this all through the, the prism of money, if you understand the flow of money as being reflective of certain interactions between human beings, this really is not hard to follow. And so uh, cities use the pretense of collecting your trash uh, as being a very expensive thing. My point is that they could easily uh, break even by charging you five bucks a month to get rid of all your trash you produce, everything. I said one of the reasons was that they pad the expenses because cities use it as an income generator uh, because, after all, people say, look, I mean, collecting trash is a... uh um, is is a you know is is a necessary service. So I understand they got to charge for that, and you completely forget that you're already paying taxes to your city, which are supposed to cover that in the first place. But we are compliant and we are docile, uh, we are hard pushed to revolution, and so we go ahead and we pay the additional uh, cost they assess us for trash collection. But there's a second reason that uh, cities charge and lose money on trash collection, and that is, yes, you got it, recycling. That's exactly right. Um, Very, very much so. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, uh, what I'm going to do, and um, uh, I I hope you're going to forgive me because it's going to sound uh, perhaps a little different from um, the, uh, the way... I normally prefer speaking. I normally prefer talking to you and telling you about things. But in this case, I I just want to come across as um, doing more than just giving you my opinion. And so I'm actually going to be quoting from a New York Times, from the Philadelphia paper, from uh, papers in Seattle and Oregon. Uh, and so these are all liberal, these are all left-wing, these are all secular fundamentalist papers, these are all... uh, My my point is that if the newspapers themselves are being compelled to acknowledge the simple reality, which is that um, a huge amount of stuff that you have laboriously separated into glass and plastic and aluminum and paper and garbage, all of that is all getting dumped in exactly the same place. Why is that? Well, because it simply is too expensive to do anything else with it. (laughs) It's as simple as that. It's just too expensive. And, uh, you know, this may change. I'm, I'm, I'm not a prophet. This may change down the road. But at the moment, and for the foreseeable future, and for the past, it simply is just too expensive. And so, um... Uh, says the New York Times, 
Oregon is serious about recycling. Its residents are accustomed to dutifully separating milk cartons, yogurt containers, cereal boxes, and kombucha bottles from their trash to divert them from the landfill. Like, landfill's a terrible thing. No, it's not. Landfill is perfectly okay. It's not a problem. But this year, because of a far-reaching rule change in China, some of the recyclables are ending up in the local dump anyway. Read that as all the recyclables are ending up in the local dump anyway. <clears throat> In recent months, says the New York Times, thousands of tons of material left curbside for recycling in dozens of American cities and towns all across the country have just gone to landfills. That's right. Do you know why? Well, it's because they used to send shiploads of the stuff to China. And China uh, used to find some way of basically sticking it <laughs> I mean, China's stuck them in landfills, but they charged American cities uh, so much for accepting their recyclables, so-called recyclables. So, so the the moral consciences of American cities are calmed by virtue of the fact that uh, oh, we ship our recyclables to China at enormous cost, huge cost, um, sixty dollars a year is what it would cost to dump it in a landfill in America. But it costs about eight times that to send it off to China. What does China do with it? Uh, well, for the most part, stick it in landfills, of course, as, as any sane nation should be doing. But uh, guess what? China said, you know what? And this is purely for um, state pride purposes. Um, you know, they've been making money on American cities, but they're saying we're stopping. First of all, we don't need it. The Chinese economy is doing great. In spite of all those people who have been doomsayers on it, I've told you for years already on this show that you don't have to worry for the foreseeable future. China is growing, and there are reasons for that. But uh, China is now saying, you know what? No more recyclables. We're not taking your garbage in. We are not going to be the garbage dump of the world. That's all. <laughs> they just don't need to engage in that business. They're not doing it anymore. They don't want to be seen in that view. They see themselves as a first world economy and accepting garbage, let that move somewhere else. And there'll always be countries willing to take the garbage, the kind of money that American cities are willing to pay in order to show their virtue. Uh, why? You know, it's not just the cities, it's that their voters, uh, the population, also buys into this idea that, oh, we've got to save the planet and we do that by shipping our recyclables for recycling. Folks, nobody is actually recycling the stuff. It makes no economic sense. Now, maybe somebody will be listening to this uh, podcast in the year 2050, and they'll say, what is he talking about? Of course it makes sense to recycle. I don't know. Maybe. But right now, in the early decades of the 21st century, no way. Not happening. Makes no sense. Nobody is actually recycling. When you read... This product is made out of 30% recyclable fiber. It's just a lie. It's simply not true. Uh, the website, and uh, there are proudly no recycled products on the rabbidaniellappin.com website. I want you to know we do not recycle electrons. We do not recycle uh, anything at all on the rabbidaniellappin.com website. But head over there anyway, because everything you see there will be fresh, unused, not the garbage out of somebody else's blue can. No siree. Uh, take a look at uh, the resource called Perils of Profanity. You are what you speak. It's nicely described on the website. You'll get a very good sense of what it's about. And I can tell you, that it makes a fantastic gift for anyone in your family who has uh, a potty mouth. Anybody who seems to lack the control to be able to speak effectively and articulate fluently needs this very inexpensive little resource called Perils of Profanity. You are what you speak. Have a look at that at rabbidaniellappin.com. Also, make sure you receive our uh, weekly emails, but you can do all of that. By the way, what's interesting are the comments. We've got very lively comment sections after each of our thought tools or Susan's musings or Ask the Rabbis. And uh, very often the, the comments are very illuminating and, uh, and Susan and I respond to them on a regular basis. Anyway, all of that, RabbiDanielLappin.com and I, your rabbi, will be back with all of you happy warriors in just a moment.
Welcome back, everybody. Yes, we are together again. I, your rabbi, solemnly pledge to reveal how the world really works. And it works when you see things accurately for what they are. Uh, When you actually absorb the reality that the cultural canyon that cuts through most Western countries today is not between dangerously radical Christians and, on the other hand, benign, good secularists. It's not how it works. The struggle is actually between benign, Bible-based religious devotees of Judaism and Christianity, and on the other side, virulent jihadists and secular fundamentalists that have made this weird alliance, which of course makes perfect sense if you really understand what the key and the essence of it is all about. And so, yeah, secular fundamentalism is a religion. It's not a benign neutrality. It's not the absence of religion. It is a religion. It's a different religion. It is absolutely incompatible with the biblical religions of Judaism and Christianity. It's another religion. And uh, just like Bible-based religion, it too has its saints. And so, for instance, uh, although most devotees of secular fundamentalism uh, do not fully understand uh, the details of what he really wrote and believed, they have nonetheless elevated to secular sainthood uh, St. Charles Darwin. Um, He would be uh, one example. Um, Another person elevated and canonized uh, was St. Paul Ehrlich wrote the book The Population Bomb, and at the time he was a professor at Stanford University. I think he he still is, if I'm not mistaken, certainly at the time of this taping, and uh, uh, it's really remarkable that anybody can be that wrong, that so calamitously in error, and still retain his job And you have the privilege of paying $60,000 a year for your children to be educated by that charlatan. But St. Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb, in which he clearly and unambiguously predicted that Americans would be dying of starvation by the year 2000. Well, uh, it's now well past 2000, and the only danger food-wise that Americans are in is obesity. Uh, So... This is part of the uh, the theology of secular fundamentalism. Uh, it's a theology that speaks of a shortage and uh, and scarcity. And understandably, since I've already explained that secular fundamentalism is a religion completely the opposite. It's the mirror image of the Bible-based faiths of Judaism and Christianity. So uh, understandably, if uh, Judaism and Christianity derive from the Bible the uh, the divine vision of abundance, where God says, I will provide for you. He doesn't say, I'll provide for you until your population on the planet um, ex- does not exceed uh, 5 billion, and after that, well, you're on your own. No, it doesn't say anything like that at all. And the, the explanation for that, obviously, is that, uh, look, are there some human beings who are takers, not givers? Are there some human beings who are consumers and not makers and builders? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Are there some human beings who uh, who live on the givings of their fellow citizens? Yeah, we may call it welfare, but it's basically, yes, there are people like that who achieve nothing, create nothing, build nothing, contribute nothing, and basically subsist on the handouts of their fellow citizens channeled through the um, uh, welfare bureaucracy of the uh, federal and state governments. Yeah, there are people like that, but it's not a lot of people. Uh, The overwhelming majority of people produce far more than than they consume, right? As I've often pointed out, uh, even a cow, right? Does a cow produce more or consume more? Again, financial analysis, you can't go wrong. If a cow ate the more hay and food and medical needs worth than 
the value of the milk it produces, farmers wouldn't keep them. Just doesn't make sense. The very fact that farmers keep herds of cows, and the more cows you've got, the more you know, the, the wealthier and more successful a farmer you are, is simply because, and I don't know the exact numbers, I'm just throwing out examples. If a cow eats, shall we say, $40 a, a month worth of food, and uh, and medical supplies and attention, and it produces a hundred dollars a month worth of milk to be made into cheese and all other dairy products. Then obviously there is a net profit derived every year from that uh, from the ownership of that cow. If cows do that, then obviously people do, and the evidence of that is that uh, all you have to do is go to a city and you'll see submerged sewer pipes out of sight. You'll see museums and art galleries. You'll see uh, all kinds of things that are produced out of the excess that people create beyond their needs. We call that taxation. Now, taxation is a lot higher than it needs be or should be, but the bottom line is that the very fact that people can pay taxes and can still save some money and put it aside and accumulate capital, all this is evidence that each and every one of us is worth far more than we consume. The idea that people are a net cost to the planet or to society, it's complete and utter nonsense, but not uh, unusual among uh, the, um, uh, those on that side of the cultural chasm. In, um, in in society today. But again, if you, if you take the view that everything is secular, that there is no God, if you take the view that this is merely a purposeless planet hurtling through the empty void of space on which accidentally, through methods explained by St. Darwin, you know, pr- primitive life forms evolved into the human beings we know today, then indeed you have nothing to look forward to but hopelessness and oblivion, because on some date the sun will extinguish. And on some date, uh, if, if demographic trends are what they are and they're notoriously unreliable, then you know maybe we will have too many people or maybe we'll uh, ruin the, the climate or maybe we'll do this or maybe we'll do that. But it's very easy to end up with a horrible, negative, doom-filled picture of tomorrow. And what happens is folks like that on the, uh, the, the, the team of secular fundamentalism end up raising children imbued with deep and dark pessimism. Uh, Whereas one of the great gifts of both Judaism and Christianity is the fact that children are raised with a sense of optimism. Now, I know, of course, what the other folks are saying. They say, oh, well, it's false. You're just, you're lying to them. You're giving them a picture that everything's well, but it isn't. Look, there've been doomsayers like you in every generation. At least I I know it going back to the uh, 1200s. I can find somebody in every generation going back to the 1200s who had a following uh, spouting this kind of hopelessness. It was how we're going to be wiped out and everything is doomed. And people grow up pessimistic with a horrible outlook, an outlook with no hope. Uh, it's, It's a shame that one of the great gifts of biblical faith is optimism and hope. And that those are very closely related, optimism and hope. And uh, on other occasions, I've explained how they are linked and how they are linked to gratitude. But uh, bottom line is that this whole gloom about scarcity and this abandonment of the image of abundance is really part of the doctrinal belief system that drives uh, recycling. It, it makes no economic sense. And the fact that you tell people and you tell cities that it makes no economic sense is fine because it's a sacrifice we pay in order to save the planet. You see, human beings need to make sacrifices of material goods for spiritual ends because we are not chimpanzees. We are human beings. It's a deep need that we have. They can either be the animal sacrifices of the temple or they can be the sacrifices of uh, we happy to pay more for electricity because we want to move towards a f- uh, uh, an organic free fuel system. We don't mind subsidizing uh, f- photovoltaic electricity and wind power, none of which make the slightest sense. Your electricity bills 
are way, way, way higher than they need to be, but it doesn't matter. You go ahead and do it anyway because there's a part of us that wants to sacrifice. Now, how do I fulfill my need to sacrifice? Well, first of all, uh, I raise with my wife seven children, and that's one of the great things about raising a family. It, it, it allows you to fulfill your need to make sacrifice. And so the uh, the times we we our budget doesn't allow us to eat out or it doesn't allow us to take a vacation or whatever it is because we are paying for the education, the private Bible-based education for our children, we feel good about that because human beings, unlike chimpanzees, do feel good about making a sacrifice. But uh, if I were a secular fundamentalist instead of a religious Jew, I would still have the need to make a sacrifice. You know how I do it? By genuflecting to my recycle bin in the kitchen, which I'm happy to tell you. Shall I disclose this or will the recycling police show up at my door? I do not have. I will not recycle. Never. Won't do it. I shouldn't say never. Maybe in the year 2050, things will have changed. But for the foreseeable future, no sorry, no recycling. And uh, part of the reason is that I know that it is an empty religious gesture on the part of secular fundamentalism because I know that it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Yes, um, Philadelphia. Um, first of all, do you know that there, the city itself, I mean, you wonder why Philadelphia is in such economic straits, desperate economic straits. Um, I, you know, apropos of last week, is also odd, but they have uh, more energy invested in inspecting for recycling. In other words, checking that businesses and people are recycling than they ever did to check out Kermit Gosnell's abortion mill at least for the very basics of sanitary and hygienic conditions. But anyway, that, that's a, uh, a reference back to last week's show. But um, uh, so Philadelphia has been going for about 25 years. They pass ordinances, ordinances requiring businesses to recycle. Now, as soon as the city pa forces a business to recycle, and by the way, voters are happy with that, right? Because it's sacrifice. It's saving the planet. Now, as soon as you uh, empower your city, to pass a law requiring businesses to recycle, well, you've also empowered them to create a bureaucracy to supervise that process. And don't be surprised, that's exactly right. They've hired a whole bunch of inspectors. They've got a whole department that checks into whether people are recycling. It costs the city millions. And are businesses actually complying? Um, actually, about 80% are not. I'm amazed that 20% are, but 80% are. Um, the city's database is completely corrupted. They've got outdated information, missing information. Um, they fail to keep track of how many properties have been inspected. This is all for recycling, but they're charging for it. They're, uh, they are, uh, they've built a huge bureaucracy for it, quoting from the um, Philadelphia Daily Inquirer. Uh, the city issues an average of three recycling citations a day for commercial properties. That's just over the last decade. Uh, they've collected only 108,000 in fines. So figure out how much it's costing them to issue three citations a day. And yet over 10 years, they've collected just about 100,000 in fines. By contrast, uh, they also they find homeowners who don't do enough recycling. They've managed to extract nearly $4 million in fines from homeowners. Uh, and they got inspectors. I mean, this is what a police state that is. $4 million in fines, and they average out 50 tickets a day to homeowners. But again, it doesn't begin to approach the cost of this. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, they, the, the, the city administration... Uh, has repeatedly pledged to make Philadelphia zero waste by 2035. It's an insanity. For what purpose? For 60 bucks a year, you can landfill a ton of garbage. This is all for religious reasons. None of this is for real reasons. Saving the planet. Uh, look, it's unbelievable. Uh, they've got 42 inspectors on the city's rolls for trying to trap violators of the recycling ordinances. It's unbelievable. 
it's, it's really incredible. But um, this, is, this is what they're doing. It's absolutely amazing how much money is wasted on this. Um, the, the city is, uh, uh, is stopping, uh, you know, and, and they, they reported actually uh, only uh, in the middle of 2018, not long ago, they reported uh, why recycling is now a money loser, not a money maker for Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, uh, they say um, a Republic Services facility in Philadelphia uh, receives 500 tons of recyclables a day. Um, and what are they doing with it? It goes to landfills. Why? Well, because a, a while back, Philadelphia was being was able to dispose of the uh, recyclables and it was about $65 a ton. Uh, now they're 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 paying um, because of the whole the China game. They were managing to to pay a little bit less, but basically now it's just ending up. And here, quoting from the uh, the, uh, the the Philadelphia paper, all the stuff meant for recycling is ending up in landfills at a cost to taxpayers. Yes, a far lower cost than it used to cost them to recycle. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Uh, how about look? And by the way, this, the stories I'm telling you about uh, are from all over the country, um, with with great fanfare and promises of a new era. Uh, Alabama's capital officials from Montgomery they got together to open a state of the art. A material recovery plant. This was in April 2014. The plant created over a hundred jobs. Again, it's not real. Uh, it's all subsidized through taxpayer money. This is not a real job at all. And this allowed Montgomery residents to put their garbage and recyclable materials in one curbside bin for pickup. The plant's sophisticated assembly line of shakers, sensors, sorters, belts, and hoses would separate recyclable material from. I mean, people believe this. Not, I want to say garbage, but that's a. Um, yeah, well, uh, this this company collected recyclables from around the region, and it used to send all that stuff to China. And, oh, they were so happy with it. It was really fantastic. But then what happened is they realized the plant was had to shut. It was totally non-economical. I guess the 100 people who had, quote, jobs lost them. They weren't real jobs. They were not economic jobs in the first place. I, I want you to understand if your job is paid for by taxpayers, well, you really got to analyze whether it's a real job. Uh, Montgomery finally began dumping its everything it picked up, recycled everything, in a landfill. Ob obviously, the plant had operated at a loss, that's all. And um, and so the plant closed with a lot less fanfare that it, oh, than it opened with. Why? Because they know people don't want to hear that recycling is unrealistic. It doesn't make sense. There's no economic sense. And if you're going to sell it to people as a sacrifice, hey, are you willing to pay more money to recycle? Be honest, at least. And I don't doubt for a moment that voters, you know, probably even a majority of voters that uh, voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, I dare say a significant number of them would probably say, yes, I want to save the planet even at cost to myself. I'm willing to do that. I'm sure there are people who'd say that. And uh, and that's exactly what they would go ahead to, to do. They'd be happy to pay the money. But cities and municipalities are very reluctant to tell the truth about this. So there, my friends, is... Uh, a, a little bit of a story of reality, of understanding what's really going on in the culture. It's not unique to the United States. It's common in many other countries because these basic fundamentals are true for all human beings everywhere at all times. Money matters. We all need to eat, and we all have a need to profess virtue by sacrifice. And if you're not going to do it through building a marriage and a family, and if you're not going to build, do it through uh, doing good for your neighborhood and for your community, through your church and through your civic organizations, if you are somebody who believes in the big G of, excuse me, the little G of government rather than the big G of God, then you are going to be a believer in recycling. 
And, um, and, and here's just one of those stories again. Never say, well, science is on our No, it isn't on your side. It isn't. Not at all. Not science, not economics, not anything else. Re- recycling is part of the your sacred sacrament of secular fundamentalism. That's all it is. And that's all you really need to know. The only other thing we need to know is that uh, we may not be running out of any space for landfill but we are running out of time for today's show. So with much appreciation, I am your rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. My website, rabbidaniellappin.com. That's right. Head over there, do your stuff, and uh, be aware that I am wishing you a week of uh, good times with your faith, with your family, with your friendships, and your finance. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.